for one minute, you can introduce yourself. I think I can read what you've written here. Because we are got five, and oh, we so only get have another, another four topic. chairs, and I hope that while discussing, we will be five sitting here, okay? So, introduce yourself. We're good. For me. I'm, I'm, I'm there. So, um, in the absence of our chair, I'm uh, <laughs> currently um, a PhD student in uh, the University of Coimbra, it's slightly up north of Lisbon, like a couple of hours. Um, I'm focusing right now on uh, uh, magic in uh, modern Portugal. And I have a graduation, which is the graduation I'm following, um, a specialization. Well, I have a master's degree in religious studies with a specialization in Western esotericism. So this is my first incursion into fiction. Um, I don't know how, how I, I will fare, but uh, hopefully it will, be, it will be good. So, as, as already stated, my presentation is called Life Through Divine Magic or Human Science, an exploration of Frankenstein in line of Henry Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy. So the point of this presentation is very early in the novel of Frankenstein, there are mentions of three authors which Frankenstein claims were the ones who originally spurred his interest into the creation of life. So the point here is to um, try to figure out who these authors are and more precisely, which of their books or their ideas Mary Shelley might be alluding to, which might be relevant for an understanding of Victor Frankenstein and consequently the creature. Then. I will focus on one of these authors, which I think is the most, most relevant, namely Agrippa, and how, because th this is the author who is actually is mentioned most often in Frankenstein, of these three, to the point where Frankenstein himself is a couple of times even compared directly to Agrippa by one of his professors in Ingolstadt. So, um, the first mention to any of these authors comes really early in the book, in chapter 2, and I'm following the 1831 edition. And Frankenstein is retelling his story to Captain Walton, and he mentions that at, cer at a certain point he was on vacation, and in the house he was staying, he chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa. I open it with apathy, the theory which he attempts to demonstrate, and the wonderful facts which he relates soon change this feeling into enthusiasm. A new light seemed to dawn upon my mind. And a few paragraphs later, when I returned home, my first care was to procure the whole works of this author, and afterwards of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. So these are the three authors that I'm going to go after. The I'm going to start with Paracelsus, first of all, or Philippus Aurelius Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim. <laughs> and he <laughs> is a, a... Primarily, Paracelsus is a Swiss physician, although he wrote an immense deal of books which touch on a variety of topics. <clears throat> For Paracelsus, and he's a, he's a very relevant, even though he is often um, displayed in media as uh, the, the archetype of um, a quack doctor, a, a magician, he is actually a fundamental theorizer of medicine. Um, he was a fundamental part of the debate between the, the new conceptions of healing in the Renaissance, namely iatrochemistry or chemical medicine, against, Paracel against um, Galenic medicine. He's also considered the father of toxicology and the first theorizer of homeopathy, meaning the cure of a certain disease of a particular nature with a remedy of the same nature, as opposed to the Galenic idea of curing a disease with its opposite. <clears throat> now, the, it needs to be understood that for Paracelsus, medicine was not a, a, a single thing. Medicine was, for him, one of the ultimate results of a particular observation of certain spiritual and religious practices. So, um, in his body of work, he makes this amazing intellectual construction, which details a particular worldview which an individual should have, on which fit um, theories of alchemy and magic, magic as a divine tool for, the, for healing. Now, returning to Frankenstein, given the topic of the 
artificial or non-sexual generation of life. The book which most likely is being alluded to when Mary Shelley mentions Frankenstein is the nine books on the nature of things. The first book of which relates directly to um, generation. In this book, um, Paracelsus describes the creation of the homunculus. And this is a very uh, famous excerpt. It's been published numerous times um, as, as a paradigmatic example of Paracelsian literature. And this is the original German, but I think we can go with the English. Let the sperm of a man by itself be putrefied in a gourd glass, sealed up with the highest degree of putrefaction in horse dung for the space of 40 days, or so long until it begin to be alive, move and stir, which may easily be seen. After this time, it will be something like a man, yet transparent and without a body. Now after this, if it be every day worldly and prudently nourished and fed with the arcanum of man's blood, and be for the space of 40 weeks kept in constant equal heat of horse dung, it will become a true and living infant, having all the members of an infant which is born of a woman, but it will be far less. This we call homunculus or artificial. <coughs> Now, out of all of the vast Paracelsian literature, this is what I suppose is the closest to the thematic of Frankenstein. The next author, Albertus Magnus, this is obviously St. Albert the Great, a medieval doctor of the church who also wrote in a tremendously vast amount of topics, theology, doctrine, and science. And truth be said, while researching for this paper, I could not find um, satisfactory example of his body of work which would fit the thematic of Frankenstein. But if we expand our view to include pseudo-Albertus literature, then we start to find a few interesting books which do seem to make sense in the context of Frankenstein. The first of these is called The Secrets of Women. And at a certain point this book describes the apparent capacity for the female womb to produce uncontrolled and monstrous forms which comes close to some of the themes approached in, in the novel. However, where I think um, Mary Shelley is pointing at is another set of uh, pseudo-Albertus texts uh, from the early 18th century, which are the Le Grain et le Petit Albert, which are French, two French books more akin to the European tradition of grimoires, namely magic books. Now, um, these two, although they are distinct books, they are frequently printed together. The Grand Albert is the more regular of the two, and it um, basically details all the occult virtues of stones, animals, herbs, and planetary influences in that kind of thing. The Petit Albert is much more explicitly magical. It, it provides an extensive list of magical procedures uh, for either most mundane preoccupations such as finding a woman or taking stains out of parchment and how to create talismans. Among its several chapters it has one called the Mandrake and in this chapter um, one has a fairly extensive list of several procedures by which one can create an artificial magical servant which does seem to derive a lot of its ideas from Paracelsus. So this is the closest I think any literature which is attributed to Albertus has in relation to Frankenstein. Now the last author, and arguably the, the most relevant, Henry Cornelius Agrippa. <coughs> uh, this was a, a Renaissance polymath. He published, he was, um, he worked as a physician, uh, a lawyer, a theologian, a soldier, and he traveled all over Europe. And the book by which he is most famous, and which I think is being alluded to in Frankenstein, is The Three Books of Occult Philosophy. Now, um, Agrippa and the three books need to be understood in a particular context. Uh, Agrippa spent a great deal of his life in Italy, where he was in contact with other thinkers such as Johann Reuschlin, Pico de Mirandola, or Marcello Ficino who were authors who, being exposed to newly available translations of ancient texts, and putting ancients in the quotation marks, uh, such as the um, Latin translation of the Corpus Hermeticum, or newly available translations of Jewish Kabbalistic literature, these were men who were trying to reconceptualize magic 
away from the condemnations of uh, ecclesiastical authorities and um, create a new form of magic as a divine instrument. The three books of occult philosophy fit precisely into this ideal. They are a rehabilitation of magic as a divine practice. In terms of structure, <clears throat> the three books uh, deal with the entirety of reality by book one deals with the natural world, book two with the celestial world, and book three the divine world. And Agrippa prescribes magic as the process by which an individual can gradually overcome these three worlds and eventually reach union with God. For Agrippa, the biblical fall was intrinsically linked to the sexual act which materialized the creative powers of man. Through magic and through the gradual elevation of the individual, achieving union with God, man would re-spiritualize his creative power and become a procreator of spiritual beings, of pure spiritual beings. And he says this in very eloquent terms, but who, but who can give a soul to an image or make a stone to live or metal or wood or wax? And who can raise out of stones children unto Abraham? Certainly this arcanum doth not enter into an artist of a stiff neck, neither can he give those things which had them not. Nobody had them but he who doth, the elements being restrained, nature being overcome, the heavens being overpowered, transcend the progress of angels and comes to the very archetype itself, of which, being then made a cooperator, may do all things as we shall speak afterwards. So this is Agrippa explicitly claiming the, the, the purpose of the three books. It is essentially uh, a book for the attainment of godhood. Now, returning to Frankenstein, the theme of godhood is, of course, explicit. Frankenstein wants himself to become a god. And in chapter 4, he does state, A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. No father could claim the gratitude of his child so completely as I should deserve theirs. <clears throat> now, um, through the early chapters of the, of the novel, even though these are the authors who ultimately bring Frankenstein into his ambition, there is, um, Frankenstein goes through a process of what might be called disenchantment where he gradually substitutes the original ideas he extracts from these authors by more modern and accurate scientific ideas. <clears throat> his, um, his desire for godhood is ultimately, he doesn't resort to magic ultimately, but rather to science. Now, this conflict in Frankenstein between science and magic, I think can be illuminated uh, in a particular excerpt, which I think is extremely revealing. And it's again in chapter 2, when, um, still relating his story to Captain Walden, he mentions that the raising of ghosts or devils was a promise liberally accorded by my favorite authors, the fulfillment of which I most eagerly sought, and if my incantations were always unsuccessful, I attributed the failure rather to my own inexperience and mistake than to a want of skill or fidelity in my instructions. Now, this excerpt, tells us two things. The first is entirely technical. And it's basically that um, when Mary Shelley inserts a mention to Agrippa in Frankenstein, she is most likely referring to a particular edition and arrangement of Agrippan material, namely one which includes what's called the fourth book of occult philosophy. Now, the fourth book of occult philosophy is a pseudo-Agrippan text. There is no evidence that Agrippa wrote it, and it actually is only published a few years after he died. This is a text much closer to the European grimoire tradition once again, and it does detail the processes and the symbols to be used for the summoning of evil spirits. <clears throat> so, in all likeliness, this is the book that's actually being referred, referred to in this particular part. Now, the second thing that this tells us is much more interesting, I believe. <clears throat> we must remember that Frankenstein is saying this after he has gone through the full arch of his own narrative, of his own story. And numerous times he does suggest that he actually does believe in the existence of spirits and ghosts. In chapter 24, a spirit of good followed and directed my steps, and when I most murmured, would suddenly extricate me from seemingly unsurmountable difficulties. A little later, the spirits that guarded me had provided these moments or other hours of happiness that I might retain strength to fulfill my pilgrimage. 
And in much more explicit terms, Walton himself, in a letter to his sister, says, he believes that when in dreams he holds converse with his friends and derives from that communion consolation for his miseries or excitement to his vengeance, that they are not creations of his fancy, but the beings themselves who visit him from the regions of a remote world. So, Frankenstein's inability to summon ghosts is not due to the inherent falsehood or fraudulent nature of magic or the non-existence of spirits, because he clearly believes in spirits, and in all likeliness he does believe in magic. <clears throat> Yet, from an early age, he seems to be unable to perform a magical act. He seems to be cursed with a form of magical impotence. Thus, he is equally unable to follow the Agrippan prescript prescripted method of gradual spiritual elevation for the creation of perfect beings, being thus relegated to science as his only hope of acquiring godhood. In this way, the creature, having ultimately a fully human origin or fully mundane or material origin cut away from the divine, is logically a monstrous creature, because not having a divine origin means that it does not have any inherent divine proportion, which would make it elegant or beautiful in any way. Now, arriving at this point, there is one further question which can be asked, and it is assumedly an um, excessively romantic question, but I think that's fine because it's a romantic book anyway. <clears throat> Having such an irreducibly human origin, does the creature have a soul? Or, in the Gripen terminology, is it a spiritual creature? The answer to this, I think, is actually given numerous times throughout the novel, but it's most evident at the very end, when, after uh, demonstrating its uh, impressive intellect and all its rage and fury, the creature eventually mourns the death of its creator, exhibiting in this way feelings of loss, compassion, and consequently love. Independently of its deformed body, the creature is in this way a perfect man, intelligent and, and sentient, and capable of an entire range of emotional states, capable of, good, of both good and evil. If the creature has any fault, it is merely that of being reckless, obsessive, and at times unaware of its full power and its consequences, just like its creator. Frankenstein thus was successful in creating a perfect creature. Nothing in it was actually missing, only from Frankenstein himself. Frankenstein lacked the capacity to love his creation, as a true creator God should, and as Agrippa and his magic would be able to teach him, were he not, as Agrippa would put it, an artist of a stiff neck. Thank you.